things as they might be, taken from the Tay of Piglet and the Day of Piglet by Benjamin Hoff. By and by, Piglet woke up. As soon as he woke, he said to himself, Oh. Then he said bravely, Yes. And then, still more bravely, Quite so. But he didn't feel very brave, for the word which was really jiggering about in his brain was heffalumps. What was the heffalump like? Was it fierce? Did it come when you whistled, and how did it come? Was it fond of pigs at all? If it was fond of pigs, did it make any difference what sort of pig? Supposing it was fierce with pigs, would it make any difference if the pig had a grandfather called Trespassers William? In this chapter, we come from the illusions of Eeyore and Tigger to those of Piglet and to illusions in general. To the Darus, unhappiness is the result of being guided by illusions, such as the mistaken belief that man is something separate from the natural world. Problems, be they economical ecological or whatever, are caused by a failure to see what's there. Unpleasant feelings come from illusions, fear from what might be, which hasn't happened yet, sadness from what might have been, which is not necessarily what would have been, and so on. Piglets living in fear of what's coming next, what can go wrong, what if I do something foolish and such, cannot enjoy and make the most of the present moment. Later they look back and realise that they didn't live it, and that realisation makes them feel more inadequate than they already did. However, because of their sensitivities, their strong experience filling and recalling memories, and their cautions, one step at a time natures, piglets far more than eels and tiggers, rabbits and owls, have the ability to rise to a challenge and accomplish the most difficult tasks once interfering illusions have been cleared away. We will begin our examination of illusions with three narratives concerning the perception of situations which show that it all depends on how one looks at things. The first is by the Taoist writer Li Zhu. A man noticed that his axe was missing. Then he saw the neighbour's son pass by. The boy looked like a thief, walked like a thief, behaved like a thief. Later that day, the man found his axe where he had left it the day before. The next time he saw the neighbour's son, the boy looked, walked and behaved like an honest, ordinary boy. The second example is the Chinese story of the well by the road. A man dug a well by the side of a road. 
for years afterward, grateful travellers talked of the wonderful well. But one night, a man fell into it and drowned. After that, people avoided the dreadful well. Later, it was discovered that the victim was a drunken thief who had left the road to avoid being captured by the night patrol, only to fall into the justice-dispensing well. Same well, different views. The third selection is from the writings of Zhuang Tse. An archer competing for a clay vessel shoots effortlessly, his skill and concentration unimpeded. If the prize is changed to a brass ornament, his hands begin to shake. If it is changed to gold, he squints as if he were going blind. His abilities do not deteriorate, but his belief in them does, as he allows the supposed value of an external reward to cloud his vision. Unfortunately, even the wise can occasionally go wrong by misinterpreting what's in front of them. In the third chapter of Winnie the Pooh, for example, a certain wise but overstuffed bear. Who's overstuffed? said Pooh. All right, Pooh, you're not overstuffed. You're physically superfluous. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, said Pooh modestly. Anyway, Winnie the Pooh, who most everyone calls Pooh for short, was. No one calls me Pooh for short, said Pooh. Just Pooh. Yes, all right. Winnie the Pooh, who most everyone calls just Pooh, was walking around and around in the snow near Piglet's house. When Piglet asked, asked him what he was doing, he said he was tracking something. He didn't know what. Possibly, just possibly, you know, it was a woozle. Possibly, it was more than that. It's a very funny thing, said Bear, but... There seem to be two animals now. This, whatever it was, has been joined by an another, whatever it is. And the two of them are now proceeding in company. Would you mind coming with me, Piglet, in case they turn out to be hostile animals? And Piglet who ought to have known better, didn't. We mean, he did. Join him, that is. There was a small spinny of larch trees just here, and it seemed as if the two woozles, if that is what they were, had been, had been going round this spinny, so round this spinney went Pooh and Piglet after them. Piglet passing the time by telling Pooh what his grandfather Trespassers W had done to remove stiffness after tracking, and how his grandfather Trespassers W had suffered in his later years from shortness of breath and other matters of interest, and Pooh wondering what a grandfather was like, and if perhaps this was two grandfathers they were after now, 
and, if so, whether he would be allowed to take one home and keep it, and what Christopher Robin would say. And still the tracks went on in front of them. Suddenly Winnie the Pooh stopped and pointed excitedly in front of him. Look! What? said Piglet with a jump. And then, to show that he hadn't been frightened, he jumped up and down once or twice in an exercising sort of way. The tracks, said Pooh. A third animal has joined the other two. So things were beginning to look slightly dangerous for Pooh and Piglet. But at least the third animal wasn't a woozle. As Pooh pointed out, his prints were different from the first two sets. They were smaller. So they went on, feeling just a little anxious now, in case the three animals in front of them were of hostile intent. And then, all of a sudden, Winnie the Pooh stopped again and licked the tip of his nose in a cooling manner, for he was feeling more hot and anxious than ever in his life before. There were four animals in front of them. The suspense was becoming unbearable. No, that's not the word we want. What we mean is... I think, said Piglet, when he had licked the tip of his nose too, and found that it brought very little comfort, I think that I have just remembered something. I have just remembered something that I forgot to do yesterday and shan't be able to do tomorrow. So suppose I really ought to go back and do it now. We'll do it this afternoon and I'll come with you, said Pooh. It isn't the sort of thing you can do in the afternoon, said Piglet quickly. It's a very particular morning thing that has to be done in the morning and, if possible, between the hours of... What would you say the time was? About twelve, said Winnie the Pooh, looking at the sun. Between, as I was saying, the hours of twelve and twelve-five, so really, dear old Pooh, if you'll excuse me. What's that? It was Christopher Robin whistling to them from the branches of a nearby tree. What a relief. Silly old bear, he said. What were you doing? First, you went round the spinney twice by yourself, and then Piglet ran after you, and you went round again together, and then you were just going round a fourth time. Oh, so that's what it was. How embarrassing. Speaking of snow, we might also mention the time that Pooh and Piglet were out on a walk and decided to build a house for Eeyore in a sheltered spot in the pine wood by Eeyore's gloomy place. Of course, they needed something to build it with. Sticks would work nicely. There was a heap of sticks on the other side of the wood, said Piglet. I saw them, lots and lots, all piled up. So they took the pile of sticks and made a house for Eeyore. And later, when Eeyore couldn't find his pile of, that is, when he couldn't find his house, he and Christopher Robin went looking for it and met Pooh and Piglet and... Where did you say it was? asked Pooh. Just here, said Eeyore. Made of sticks, 
Yes. Oh, said Piglet. What? said Eeyore. I just said, oh, said Piglet nervously. And so as to seem quite at ease, he hummed tiddly pom once or twice in a what shall we do now kind of way. You're sure it was a house, said Pooh. I mean, you're sure the house was just here? Of course I am, said Eeyore, and he murmured to himself, no brain at all, some of them. Why, what's the matter, Pooh asked Christopher Robin. Well, said Pooh, the fact is, said Pooh, well, the fact is, said Pooh. You see, said Pooh, it's like this, said Pooh. And something seemed to tell him that he wasn't explaining very well, and he nudged Piglet again. It's like this, said Piglet quickly. Only warmer, he added after deep thought. What's warmer? The other side of the wood, where Eeyore's house is. So they went there and Eeyore found his house and... So they left him in it and Christopher Robin went back to lunch with his friends Pooh and Piglet. And on, and on the way they told him of the awful mistake they had made. And when he had finished laughing, they all sang the outdoor song the snowy weather the rest of the way home. How embarrassing. We're back, said Pooh. So you are. I was so busy writing that I didn't realise you'd gone. Piglet and I were just going over some riddles, said Pooh. Piglet has one for you. Very good, Piglet. What's your riddle? It's this, said Piglet. What barks and has feathers? Barks and has feathers? Uh, I don't know. A bird dog. Hmm. Something wrong, asked Piglet. All right, Piglet, here's one for you. What's the difference between a filing cabinet and a kangaroo. I don't know, said Piglet. You don't? You don't know the difference between a filing cabinet and a kangaroo? No, said Piglet. Well then, I won't let you file any of my papers. Silence. I don't get it, said Pooh. In addition to the common human tendency to misinterpret what's there, as demonstrated by sometimes a little too human Pooh and Piglet in the snow just now, we might mention the inclination of a good many people to fail to notice anything but the unusual, as can be illustrated by the Chinese story of the ox and the rat. Many years ago, Buddha called twelve animals before him and told them he would name a year of the Chinese zodiac after each. The animals were very pleased, but when the question of order arose and trouble began, I should be first, said the rat, because of my intelligence. No, I should be first, said the ox, because of my size. The two animals argued for some time about which was more important, intelligence or size. After a while, the rat fell silent. All right, he said at last. I admit that size is more important. Good, said the ox. It's settled. Not so fast, said the rat. My size is more impressive than yours. What? 
snorted the indignant ox. How can you, a mere rodent, impress anyone with your size? Let us go before the people, replied the rat, and let the opinion of the majority decide. Ridiculous, the ox exclaimed. Why should we waste time on your nonsense? Anyone can see that. Now, now, said Buddha, let's not argue about it any longer. Of course the rat is smaller than you are, but why not let the majority of the people decide? Whoever more impresses them with his size shall be declared the winner. The ox, certain of victory, agreed. Lord Buddha, said the rat, with the consent of the ox, I wish to have one favour granted before we present ourselves. If I am truly as small as the ox insists I am, I should like to lessen my inevitable embarrassment. Therefore, I ask that you temporarily double my size. Buddha asked the ox if he had any objections. Of course not, the ox answered. After all, how much difference could it make? I'd still be 100 times bigger than he is. The ox and the rat, the rat now twice as ordinary size, went out and walked among the crowds. Everywhere they went, people exclaimed in amazement. Look at the size of that rat, they shouted. Look at that enormous rat. No one noticed the ox. Everyone had seen an ox before. There was nothing unusual about him. And that is how the rat impressed the people with his size and became the first animal in the Chinese zodiac. By the way, Piglet, I've been thinking about that sign by your house. You mean Trespassers W? Yes. That was your grandfather's name, you said. Yes, Trespassers William. Well, he must have been a rather large pig to put up such a tall sign. Uh, well, he didn't put it up himself. A friend did it for him. A friend? Yes, another sort of animal, a tall sort of animal. You mean like a giraffe? Yes, yes, a giraffe. That was it. It must have been an, an amusing friendship a pig and a giraffe. I didn't know giraffes could be found around here. They can't, said Piglet, ordinarily, but this giraffe was over here on an exchange programme. Oh, what did we send in exchange? Um, a box of weasels. That doesn't sound like a fair, very fair exchange. Well, it was a large box. Yes, well, speaking of illusions, let's return to that subject. We believe there are a few things more to be said. Although illusions exist all over the world, the Industrial West seems to have more than a fair share of them. And the illusions of the West which of course by now have been exported to the East, deserve to be watched out for with special care. It seems rather I ironic somehow that realis re realistic scientific Western industrial society sneers at the rel relatively harmless myths and acquired beliefs of the native peoples of the world a good many of which have at least some basis in fact, while perpetuating 
irrational beliefs and practices so dangerous that they are destroying the earth. And probably the most destructive of all the illusions of the West is the superstitious notion that technology will solve all our difficulties. This technology worship could be said to have started in Western Europe in the 1500s or so, with explorations and expansions that led to the growth of commercialism, which led to the Industrial Revolution of the 1700s. The rapid proliferation of hungry machines and the accompanying breakneck exploitation of natural resources with which to feed them quickly transformed rural agricultural societies. Good morning, Mrs. Witherspoon. What a lovely cow. Into city and factory societies. I certainly hope, gas, wheeze, we don't run out of cough, co, before the day is over. And then into big city, big industry, industry societies. That's right, Inspector. They stole everything that wasn't fastened to the floor. In the Victorian era, this industrial fanatism was given a large boost by empire and opinion makers who believed that science could do anything and that any opinions to the contrary, were heresy. But well before then, some similar pillage the earth and let's have no nonsense about it nonsense, had been exported from Europe to the New World. And with with it came the absurd and groundless belief that money could buy happiness. It would have been rather surprising if such a belief had not arrived on these shores, considering that a good many of the earliest immigrants were debtors from English prisons, fur trappers, tobacco and cotton barons to be, and Puritan tradesmen. Such people tended to know enough about the natural world to exploit it, but not much more if indeed they knew even that. The Puritans, in particular, knew next to nothing about how to get along in the North American forests, meadows and mountains, and next to nothing about how to get along with the people who did. As the old saying puts it, they fell first upon their knees, and then upon the Indians and then upon the landscape, as Luther standing bare, chief of the Oglala Sioux, described the situation. We did not think of the great open plains, the beautiful rolling hills and winding streams with tangled growth as wild. Only to the white man was nature a wilderness, and only to him was the land infested with wild animals and savage people. To us it was tame. Earth was bountiful, and we were surrounded with the blessings of the great mystery. Not until the hairy man from the east came and with brutal frenzy heaped injustices upon us and the families we loved, was it wild for us. When the very animals of the forest began fleeing from his approach, then it was that for us the Wild West began. Today, thanks to this rather lopsided cultural foundation, we live in what is commonly described as a materialistic society, but that description is in error. Ours is in reality an abstract value society, 
one in which things are not appreciated for what they are, so much as for what they represent. If Western industrial society appreciated the material world, there would be no junkyards, no clear-cut forests, no shoddily designed and manufactured products, no poisoned water sources, no obese, fuel-guzzling automobiles, nor any of the other horrors and eyesores that haunt us at every turn. If ours were a materialistic society, we would love the physical world and we would know our limits within it. In truth, Western industrial society does not even notice the material world. It quickly discards it, leaves it to rust in the rain. The material world is here and now, and industrial society does not appreciate or pay attention to the here and now. It is too busy coveting and rushing after the there and later on. As a result, it all too often fails to see what is right in front of us and what's coming from that. It forgets where it has been. It does not know where it is going. Going on an exposition. Expedition, said Pooh eagerly. I don't think I've ever been on one of the, those. Where are we going to on this expedition? Expedition, silly old bear, it's got an X in it. Oh, said Pooh, I know, but he didn't really. We're going to discover the North Pole. Oh, said Pooh again. What is the North Pole, he asked. It's just a thing you discover, said Christopher Robin carelessly, not being quite sure himself. Perhaps the preceding glimpse at our historical conditioning can help to explain why Western industrial society has such a poor record when it comes to observing what's there. In our part of the world, this unobservant tendency is displayed in the most depressing manner whenever there's an election. For nearly 30 years now, the nation that was once the light of the free world has been electing to the highest office in the land a succession of nightmare clowns who lead us deeper and deeper into darkness as they encourage massive greed and corruption, run up multi-billion dollar debts for future generations to pay, turn the economy into jelly, refuse to take action necessary to save what's left of the natural world. More studies are needed and threaten to blow up the planet because some country somewhere isn't doing what they think it ought to quickly what they think it ought to quickly enough. All the while making remarks on the intelligence level of if you've seen one redwood tree You've seen them all. And speaking of trees, if the majority of voters are not living in some sort of fantasy, why this increasing tendency to talk about protecting the environment while voting more than ever against it? In a recent election in our once almost environmentalist home state, for example, the majority voted to allow one of the nation's most notoriously unsafe and unnecessary nuclear power plants to continue operation despite its persistent violation of vital safety regulations, rejected a measure that would have restricted throwaway packaging and turned down an honest, self-funded, pro-environment political candidate to re-elect a politician who for years has actively opposed the preservation 
of what little remains of the state's uncut forests, who supports the timber industry's policy of clear-cutting public lands and sending the logs overseas for processing, thereby shutting down local mills, and who has annually appended to appropriations bills, riders forbidding citizens from challenging this policy in court, so much for planet Earth. The natural world is all right, voters across the country seem to be saying, as long as its preservation doesn't interfere with the process of destroying it to earn money. Let someone else pay for its protection. But considering that less than 1% of American philanthropic giving goes to conservation, it would appear that someone else is just another fantasy. We're all going on an expedition with Christopher Robin. What is it when we're on it? A sort of boat, I think, said Blue. Oh, that sort. Yes, and we're going to discover a pole or something. Or was it a mole? Anyway, we're going to discover it. Unfortunately for our chances of survival and happiness, we in the West have inherited an Eeyore version of religion, which denounces the world as an evil place whose ways are to be ignored by the wise, and an Eeyore sort of science which sneers at everything beyond a mechanistic view of the earth the secrets of which it attempts to sneak out of it bit by bit for the purpose of manipulating the natural world. Is either of these ways very likely to get us out of the mess we're in or to even help us see what's causing it? Eeyore religion says that the earth isn't worth saving anyway and that when it comes to an end, the faithful will be transported instantly to heaven. No problem. We'd like to see them explain things to St. Peter at the gate when he asks them what did, what they did with the world that God entrusted to them. That might get a bit sticky. Eeyore Science, on the other hand, insists that technology will rescue us from destruction including the considerable destruction that technology causes. When it tells us things like that, we can't help but wonder if it isn't tr trying to be some sort of religion itself. No, not a religion exactly, some sort of voodoo. Wonga Wonga Moomba Moonga Great Tin God Save us from hexchlorobenzene, ethylene dibromide, toxophene, chlorodane, carthium, and everything else you've given us that's gone wrong. Well, woonga woonga everybody, and lots of luck. Oh, piglet, said Pooh excitedly, we're going on an expedition. All of us with things to eat. To discover something. To discover what, said Piglet, anxiously. Oh, just something. Nothing fierce. Christopher Robin didn't say anything about fierce. He just said it had an X. It isn't their necks, I mind, said Piglet, earnestly. It's their teeth. The fearful fantasies we have inherited have conditioned us to believe that we need to be protected from the natural world, better living through heavy industry and so on. In reality, as anyone ought to be able to see by now, the natural world needs to be protected from us. 
its wisdom needs to be recognised, respected and understood by us, and not merely viewed through the distorted lenses of our illusions about it. As Sir Arthur Conan Doyle cautioned through his character Sherlock Holmes, one's ideas must be as broad as nature if they are to interpret nature, and when one tries to rise above nature, one is liable to fall below it. Chuang Tzu's words to that effect have a timely ring. When leaders pursue knowledge but do not follow the way, all who follow them become lost in confusion. How can I say this is so? Much knowledge is applied to the making of bows, crossbows, arrows and slingshots. But the birds in the air are disturbed and injured by it. Much knowledge is used in making hooks, nets and other such devices. But the fish in the waters are disturbed and injured by it. Much knowledge is utilised in the design and placement of traps, meshes and snares and the creatures of the ground are disturbed and injured by it. As knowledge becomes increasingly clever, versatile and artful, the people all around are disturbed and injured by it. They then struggle to grasp what they do not know, but think, but make no attempt to grasp what they know already. They condemn the misunderstanding of others, but do not condemn their own. From this more confusion comes. From this more confusion comes. If the sun and moon lost their light, the mountains and rivers abandoned their vitality, and the four seasons came to an end, no insect or plant would retain its true nature. Yet this is the condition produced in men by an obsession for knowledge. Honesty and simplicity are overlooked and restlessness is, is admired. Quiet, effortless action is forgotten and loud quarrelling is heard. Such is the nature of hunger for knowledge. Its noise throws the world into chaos. We might add some other words by Chuang Tzu. Men honour what lies within the sphere of their knowledge, but do not realise how dependent they are on what lies beyond it. To illustrate the vital truth of that last statement, we have decided to give a very brief history of what we call popular radiation. In the 1930s, as people were dying from the effects of radium-laced health ton tonics, the US government established its first maximum level of tolerable exposure to radiation, just in case you know. In the 1940s, following the study of Hiroshima bombing victims, that level was halved, just to be safe, you understand. In the 1950s, in response to concern over nuclear bomb testing fallout, which seemed to be affecting some people in unpleasant ways, the maximum tolerable level was um, substantially lowered, just as a precaution. At the same time, however, utility company advertisements were extolling the charms of the newest form of power generation clean, safe, nuclear energy. Their billboard, billboards invited customers to take the family to the nuclear power park. X-ray machines were being used in shoe stores to examine children's feet. And people were having their supposedly enlarged but actually normal thymus glands ir irradiated. Like many exposed to radiation before them, 
a sizable number of these people developed cancer and died. In the 1960s, more and more people came to suspect that they weren't being told the whole truth about this sort of thing. And then, in the 1970s, researchers reported that Americans were being exposed to nine times more radiation from medical applications than from atmospheric nuclear fallout, which by then, due in part to studies of certain Nevada residents and military personnel, was being connected with all sorts of problems. In 1979, the Three Mile Island nuclear power facility broke down and ir irradiated the surrounding area. In the 1980s, New data on the Hiroshima victims and the descendants showed that the risk of cancer from radiation was up to 15 times greater than authorities had previously believed. Emissions from nuclear plants were linked with thyroid damage, miscarriages and other health problems. And before the end of the decade, the Chernobyl nuclear facility, like Three Mile Island before it, had done what experts in the field have said it wouldn't do in a thousand years. Reports of near disasters at other plants were being leaked to the press. So the safe exposure level was lowered again, not taking any chances. At each step of the way, authorities assured the public that the new devices and new amounts of radiation were safe and each time they were wrong. Today the public is being captivated by computers, word processors and the like, whose cathode ray tubes emit X-ray radiation and whose circuits and display terminals produce strong electromagnetic fields. They're perfectly safe, authorities assure us, and if any difficulties should happen to develop, we will certainly be notified later on. The latest popular radiation devices is the microwave oven, which bombards food with high frequency electromagnetic radiation, irritating, irritating it until it heats up. This sort of perversion of nature is perfectly safe, authorities insist. If it weren't, the wonderful machines wouldn't be on the market. Maybe the authorities are correct this time, just for once. On the other hand, maybe they're not. As soon as he had finished his lunch, Christopher Robin whispered to Rabbit and Rabbit said, Yes, yes, of course and they walked a little way up the stream together. I didn't want the others to hear, said Christopher Robin. Quite so, said Rabbit, looking important. It's, I wondered, it's only, Rabbit, I suppose you don't know, what does the North Pole look like? Well, said Rabbit, stroking his whiskers, now you're asking me. I did know once, only... I've sort of forgotten, said Christopher, Christopher Robin carelessly. It's a funny thing, said Rabbit, but I've sort of forgotten too, although I did know once. I suppose it's just a pole struck in the ground. Sure to be a pole, said Rabbit, because of calling it a pole, and if it's a pole, well, I should think it would be sticking in the ground, shouldn't you, because... There'd be nowhere else to stick it. Yes, that's what I thought. The only thing, said Rabbit, is where is it sticking? That's what we're looking for, said Christopher Robin. Say, Piglet, what's that at the window? It's the heifer lump, said Piglet, jumping straight up in the lawn. Oh, it's the garbage man taking away the recycling. 
You didn't think, really think, it was ever lump, did you? No, Pat, Pat, no, Pat, really. Now, Piglet, what if it had been a heifer lump? What could he have done to you? I don't know, squeaked Piglet, but he might have thought of something. You don't even know what a heifer lump is, do you? No, not exactly. You don't even know if heifer, lump, heifer lumps exist. Well, do they? Not in this part of the world, anyway. Not lurking about outside the window. Are you sure? Absolutely. You won't find a heifer lump around here any more than you'll find a giraffe putting up a sign by your house. Oh, said Piglet, I see. Where were we? Oh yes, dangerous illusions. In his amazingly Dowers-like magical child, Joseph Chilton Pierce described our society's predicament this way. How do we believe that we can predict and control the natural forces of the universe through clever intellectual manipulations and tool usage? We accept this notion so completely because we have been conditioned to believe implicitly that only by so using our intelligence can we, in fact, survive nature. Interaction between the mind-brain and its source of information, the earth, has been rigorously, rig religiously denied by Western logic, if not most cultural logic. Interaction with the living earth would imply that the earth responded in kind, interacting with us. And the one cardinal rule of all classical Western academic belief is that the mind has absolutely no relation to the world other than to be informed of that world through the senses and to make some sort of intellectual, intelligent reaction to that information. This belief has automatically robbed us of personal power. Having no personal power to draw on, we are reduced to only one source of power, tool usage. And so, we have evolved a continuing body of knowledge concerning the employment, creation, enhancement and service of tools. Our real criterion of value becomes the culture's body of knowledge offering or promising enhanced tool production, possible domination of nature, and so some security. Potential is seen as an increase of tools, our emphasis. The training and education of children is designed to lead to better tool invention, production, consumption and handling. Our body of knowledge and tool development has never given, is not pleasantly giving, and almost surely will never give us either physical security or well-being. The more vast and awesome our tool production has become, the greater our anxiety, hostility, fear, resentment and aggression. But the direct correlation between our, our anxiety and tool production is almost beyond our grasp because our intelligence is itself the, the result of our conditioning by and within that very body of knowledge. Our intelligence is trained to believe that any imperfections in the reality resulting from our activities, such as personal anguish, misery and fear, simply indicate the need for improvements in the body of knowledge and or improvements in tool production, distribution and application. Even as our body of knowledge splits us off from our lives and creates anxiety and unhappiness, it conditions us to believe religiously that escape from our misery 
lies in perfecting that body of knowledge. In other words, modern man's difficulties, dangerous beliefs and feelings of loneliness, spiritual emptiness and personal weakness are caused by his illusions about and separation from the natural world. Well, the Taoists told us this sort of mess would happen, and they told us what we could do about it. Now it's time to see what that is.